Hi, I'm Bob Norton, and this is the Growth and Scaling Workshop Series. Today's topic is market entry and growth strategies. And as you'll see, it is a topic that many people get wrong or don't do enough work to get right. This replay will be available to everyone uh, who registered. And if you want all 12 sessions, you can you can get a purchase and have a whole recording set of everything. So let, let's get going now. Quick background. I'm going to fly through these first five slides because they're redundant in all of the sessions, but this is just a little background on me. I grew two startups to over 100 million in sales, one to 156 million in sales in five years or less each, generated over a billion dollars in net profit for my investors, which was a 25x return. I created the CEO Bootcamp in 2004. And I was early in my career, the first eight years, I was a technologist, VP of engineering and chief technical officer, where I ran the Skunk Works and created five products, all of which became 20 plus million dollar businesses very rapidly, which is probably more than $40 million today. I've worked in 40 or maybe more industries. I haven't counted them recently. That number is kind of old. And I like to do a lot of variety of things. There's my there's my boat um, Endeavor, which is a 42 foot Beneteau first that I have have raced a little. Most people understand that startups fail a lot. You know the numbers are 80, 85 percent, depending on what source you listen to. In actuality, we know it has to be more because not every company incorporates making it measurable before it uh, bankrupts itself, right? And so statistically speaking, that number is probably high. But what most people don't know is that only one in 400 companies will ever reach 10 million and one in 6,300 companies will reach 100 million. So it's a very tiny percentage. And being you know, in this and scaling companies for over 35 years, I understand all the elements of that. Matter of fact, I wrote a, uh, a short ebook on it, which is on the, the top reasons that uh, that companies fail, and that's available to everyone. Just email me, and I'll uh, I'll send you a copy of it. We do have a uh, it available on the the website as well. But statistically, that makes it twelve hundred and sixty times harder to build a hundred million dollar company than it is to make a profitable startup, right? And a profitable startup is is hard enough. You've got a one in five chance of doing that. And of course, we're not really talking about, you know, replicating someone else's business model or using a franchise or a job, you know, where you're just renting out your time. We're talking about a scalable business here that can reach multi-millions in sales and, and hopefully ultimately 10 to to 100 million. I like to say any company can be a billion dollar company because a company is just a legal entity that you put products and services into. And so if you have a core group and an innovative culture that continues to invent new products and innovate, you know, that company can basically keep growing forever. Um, we define scaling as growing at more than 25% compound rate annually. And the way you have to operate is very different uh, when you have that growth rate because your management team is diluted as the company grows and you have to bring more people in. You need to systematize and have a lot of automation where you can, but more importantly, you have to be able to learn to run the business by the numbers and know when and where to dedicate management time. So airtight management is really for companies with a million sales. It, it is a framework that is more comprehensive than the second closest thing out there. We have hundreds of tools and hundreds of principles and six main systems that are dropped into a company to solve the problem that um, Jim Collins talks about in Good to Great. At 5%, you're really not growing because on an inflation-adjusted basis, you know, you may be shrinking, you know, with the you know, inflation rates that, that are out there and, and don't believe what the government tells you because it's always more. <laughs> the mathematics of this are very compelling. The wealth creation is going to go to the employees and investors who are in those companies because of the compounding effect. You are not scalable unless you're in the top right of this chart. 
okay, a commodity company is not scalable, you'd have to throw enormous amounts of money at it to gain market share. Because if you're a commodity, you don't have profit margins that you can reinvest in the growth. Scale, scaling at 25% is possible when you have competitive, either at customer service or you have something that makes you a little different than the average company doing the same thing out there. If you're distinct or a breakthrough, you know, and, and we can all name the unicorns, you know, of Google and Facebook and Microsoft that, that became multi-billion dollar companies. They were in that top right segment where they were breakthrough and really uh, created a new market. You know, Bill Vision was a PC on every desk. And that used to sound crazy, but of course it's true now for most people. Uh, and that will continue um, to add productivity as we add AI and other technologies. Nothing is as permanent except change. Differentiation is the very most important word that everything has to build on because everything good in a business comes from that differentiation. You, you know, protectability is second because you don't want people just copying what you're doing or you get commoditized. And this is the math of this. Everyone remembers probably the Ben Franklin thing, the way to get rich is compounding interest. And he was talking about 5%. We're talking about 10 times that, or even 20 times that with 50 and 100% growth rates. And this is what this looks like. Investors and managers that are smart only want to be in those companies that are growing at 50 to 100% because that's when their stock options and real wealth creation happens. And frankly, it's a lot more fun as well because you're not chasing money. Money is chasing you. You're not chasing customers. Customers are chasing you because you're established to have that, that kind of growth. And, and that requires a lot. So now let's move into the marketing strategy here. Some market acronyms that you've probably heard. TAM is for total available market. And that's a very broad uh, term. And, and people tend to exaggerate it too much. And sometimes they lose credibility presenting to investors because they claim that TAM is, is very big when it's not. Um, serviceable available market, SAM, is sort of the next level. That's the, you know, the, the customers in that total market that you can actually service. Maybe that's because of geographic decisions or marketing or, or some other variable. And then the serviceable attainable market, the SOM, that, that's really what you're targeting. And Contrary to popular belief, smaller is better in a market entry strategy. The last thing in the world you want to do is go after a multi-billion dollar market as a startup. That's You want to be a big fish in a small pond because you don't want to be in the ocean where the 800-pound gorillas, a mix of my metaphors, are going to show up and be your competitors and be competing with Apple and Microsoft and Google and and other companies that can drop 20, 30, 50, or 100 million on a new business venture. So it's very important to understand these, and we're going to talk about them more specifically, or you look like an idiot because you're, you're really not talking about it. I mean, I've seen many, many in angel presentations, thousands of them, and I would say half of them exaggerate their market by not understanding the difference between the TAM and the SOM of what they can get at. So what I'm going to do is a quick case study here, and I doubt anyone has heard of this company that hasn't been through my courses. We're going to study a company who you probably don't know that invented some of the most popular and valuable things that we use every day and patented them all, but failed to have a market entry strategy. And it should have been a trillion dollar company, but it crashed and burned because of many mistakes. So we're gonna list some of those mistakes for you and talk about that in a quick case study here. But market entry strategy is necessary and most people do it wrong. They wanna say as the entrepreneur, my product or my service is good for everyone. And the result is there, you know, it's the old marketing saying, if you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one, right? And venture capitalists tend to call this trying to boil the ocean. In other words, you're you know, you're not a specialist, you're a generalist, and you're going after everyone, and that doesn't work. So quickly speaking, 
These guys are probably known as the most successful company no one ever heard of. There is a documentary on it because it's such a spectacular flop and wasted hundreds of millions of dollars. Not that there's a shortage of those. But this is all about market entry strategy being wrong. They were founded in May of 1990. They had some of the best engineers and visionaries in the world. They invented USB. They created the first vision for the iPhone and the iPad 15 years before Apple did. And Apple ultimately wound up uh, buying uh, or licensing many of their patents created mobile computing and, and created the first wireless connection device designed to be in your pocket. They created the first animated emoticons, and they were basically years, if not decade or more, ahead of everybody else. But in fact, that was a downside for them. They were too far ahead. I've uh, blotted out the logo here to not tell you the company name yet. Sony made this hardware, but they, of course, made the operating system and the software that was in this first version of their desktop pocket app that was a phone, an internet connection, a calendar, a note taker, and all those things together. Four years after founding. So they took four years to get it out because they didn't do an MVP. And, and everyone should read the Lean Startup and how it talks about doing a, a minimum viable product, an MVP, to prove your market before you spend more money, because you'll always learn going into a marketplace. The first smartphone uh, with a PDA touchscreen, all of this was visioned here. And the hardware wasn't good enough to do it well yet. So you'll see you have a pixelated screen there. I think it was an LCD screen was the technology at the time. Two colors. Nokia came out in 1992, was also a partner of theirs. They had about 20 major corporate partners. So they were not lacking in distribution and partnerships either. Again, it was their market strategy that made them fail. They created the first general purpose um, you know, iPad-like device. They pushed voice recognition, although I don't think they ever implemented that, but it was part of their plans. They were actually known as the first concept IPO, be meaning an IPO of a lot of money where they didn't have any revenue yet. And so their vision was powerful enough that they were able to sell all these ideas to Wall Street and raise a couple, uh, a couple hundred, 300 million total. 96 was from the IPO and 200 million were partner contributions in those first, first years before they went public. Stock even doubled after the IPO. Uh, they had huge partners, Motorola, Sony, AT&T. And, and they shut down in 2002. And Paul Allen, the second founder of Microsoft, that bought their patents because he had the vision to understand that this is the future. But the technology, the hardware specifically needs to catch up. So uh, anyone want to take a guess at if you know who these guys are, put it in the in the chat. They should have been worth a trillion dollars and they blew it. And we're going to list the reasons why. So you don't make those mistakes. General Magic was the name of the company. And they basically were too far ahead and they tried to do everything at once and did not have a niche to enter, and, and that caused all kinds of marketing expenses and, and, and technology issues. Listing quickly here some other mistakes. They had a four-year development cycle. In software, you typically want no more than a six-month development cycle. And, and maybe if you're operating in stealth mode with a very small team, it might go a year or 18 months, but it should never go four years. And anyone that knows anything about enterprise software development probably would state that. They tried to do too much in a first release. Again, not an MVP. They had no clear target customer. They were really trying to launch into a horizontal market and provide a device to do everything for everyone. Salesforce started going after traveling salespeople because those are the people that needed the software in the cloud. Back then, they hung signs in every airport so all the salespeople would have name recognition on that product, right? They didn't start out being the CRM for everyone. They started out being the CRM for traveling salespeople, which was a much easier market to address and market to and meet the feature needs of as, as well as much, much cheaper to identify and sell to. Other mistakes General Magic made, they, they actually decided that they didn't want any managers. 
right? They thought managing, you know, they're engineers. This is probably the biggest decision that killed them because that's what made them not having a marketing department and a marketing entry strategy. They had too much money, which enabled them to move slowly. Too much money is a problem. It defocuses people and it makes you want to build a battleship when your MVP should be a little, you know, mosquito speedboat that you get feedback from because you're always going to learn from that and, and do some pivot. It might not be a full pivot, but it's going to be adjustment. They got very complicated with their politics and their political alliances because, again, they were trying to do too much for everybody. And essentially, Apple came out, even though they were aligned with them and, and came out with the Newton. And of course, Apple had brand recognition and more credibility in the startup and everything else. So they were actually killed by one of their own partners who was probably aware of everything they were doing and, and stole some of the ideas, I would think. Uh, it's only human nature, and it's hard to turn that stuff off. Um, they also had no single architect or product visionary for a company to be scalable. There has to be a visionary, there has to be an operator, and there has to be a marketing or slash or salesperson, depending on the, the sales strategy and marketing strategy you have in the business. And all of those, and people push back on this on me all the time, and I challenge them to find an exception, and they never do. All of those people need 15 plus years experience. The story of the boy genius and girl genius that graduates college and builds a multi-billion dollar company is total bullshit. It never, ever happened. No, Google didn't do it. No, Microsoft didn't do it. No, Apple didn't do it. They all hired gray-haired individuals that had the business experience and the scaling experience to run a company. And that doesn't mean they were all full-time people. They had boards and they had advisory boards and other things, but they, they had those three positions filled and focus on those things. So sadly, every one of these would have been prevented if they didn't have this false belief among the engineers that we don't want or need any managers. And, and so $300 million in investor money went down the drain because the engineers wanted to make all the decisions, which, you know, essentially is the, uh, the druggies running the pharmacy, <laughs> to some extent, you would say. <clears throat> so what allowed this to happen? Well, others faith in the outcome. You know, they were selling a concept, but no one understood that the hardware wasn't ready yet. So they were way ahead of their time. They were expecting Moore's Law to help catch up the doubling of computer power every 18 months. Uh, but the hardware was really many years away, and they could have selected products from their patent portfolio that were enabled by the existing hardware. They didn't get customer validation. Uh, they tried to do too much all at once. I can't say that enough. Their leadership uh, was a total failure because they didn't have a united strategy and vision uh, other than the battleship that would do everything for everyone. And that's never how you enter a market. Overconfidence and overhype raised expectations. And, and I would call the, the engineering folks because, you know, if you hire five PhDs and put them in the same room, they're going to argue constantly. You need a single architect to be the filter an arbiter, and, and that doesn't mean they're going to make they're the best or they're going to make all the decisions right, but it causes synergy, it causes alignment, it causes rapid decisions, not analysis paralysis. And you can always correct most false or, or bad decisions later. As, as Jeff Bezos says, you know, there are two types of decisions, those are the reversible and those that aren't and never struggle on one that's quickly reversible because you'll do it, you'll learn from it and you'll adjust rapidly. Some other things, and these are psychological principles. We teach a lot of mindset and psychology in our courses, including you know how to identify you know psychopaths and sociopaths so you don't have them because they can destroy your your company rather as internal employees. A lot of people have overconfidence. This, this picture reminds me of the crocodile hunter guy who you know ultimately got stung by a, uh, a stingray. You know, he was just flying too close to the sun for too long. So there are many psychological principles at play here. You know, some would call it a God complex. The Kruger-Dunning effect is when people think they're smarter than they actually are because they don't 
understand and, and, you know, work with people who are smarter than them, arrogance, pride, dumbness, not listening to others. I'm sure every single one of these happened in general magic. So I'd, I'd like to do a quick poll, just put in the, in the chat box, what your three-step market entry strategy is, or pause the video if you're watching the replay and take a couple minutes to think that out. And we're going to give you an example and we're going to uh, use one example as Tesla that we're going to go through, but there are many examples. And if you look at these things, you find out that we will have a, a multi-step market entry strategy in any company that really was massively successful. So this is called the dog food test. It was created by Rob Ryan and a great book I always recommend called Entrepreneur America. And it's basically a rating system to look at a startup in the stealth days and the concept days to rate a company and decide, you know, if if an investment is a smart idea. And so I filled this in for general magic. And, and as you can see, in differentiation, they hit it out of the park. They had 50 different ways they were differentiated in a patent portfolio and, you know, uh, probably 10 or more different products they could have done, but they tried to do it all at once. And, and so it didn't work. The, their value w was high, but only in pieces that were executable by the hardware, they were too early. They didn't identify their market, so they couldn't identify a known pain. Again, they were trying to connect everyone on the internet, give them a phone, basically do what Apple did with the iPhone 15 years later before the, the hardware and the software was capable of doing it. So they were ahead of their time. Risk map, I, I think it's very valuable. It's the first thing I look at for an angel investment and, and run in my head. The team was top notch, other than it was missing a quality experience CEO and management. Now, the engineering team was top notch, but the management team was almost non existent. And that's the reason they crashed and burned. Um, did they have barriers to entry? Absolutely. They had a huge pat patent portfolio. They did not have a strategy, right? Because market entry is part of your strategy and a very important part. And we'll talk about how you do it right uh, in just a minute. So the main reason they failed is really not having focus in a market entry strategy. They tried to do too much at once before it was pop, pop, uh, possible, and they didn't validate their product. Sometimes you got to do that by showing a brochure to a customer. And there's always the, the famous saying that uh, Henry Ford said, if I asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And so if you're a disruptive business, you can't expect the customer to envision what that product is. You have to show them a prototype or demonstrate it or, or do it in other ways. But if you're an extension or a product add-on, then the, the customer feedback is, is absolutely critical. And either way, you can do a lot of it. So, But I would say over 90% of companies get market entry wrong. And that's based on well over a thousand pitches that I've seen at angel investment meetings. I've been a a coach and a, a committee member on various, you know, investor, angel investor groups and everything over the years. I've, I've done four or five different stints and, and spent many years and, and looked at well over a thousand pitches. I would say that 90% do not get this simple concept. Go to market strategy is not the same as your three to five year market entry strategy. It must be different. You will kill yourself if you go after a billion dollar or multi-billion dollar market on day one, because not only will you be having massive sales and marketing costs and not be able to break through the marketing clutter and the noise of the 4,000 plus advertisements that we see every day, but you'll wind up uh, not getting at that customer because marketing works, you know, on, on average, you've got to hit someone 11 times before they're going to remember you as, as a statistic, right? So you want to hit 10% of the target market 11 times, not 100% of a target market once. It's not going to work at all. You're not going to make any progress. Um, you've got to have a plan to double or, you know, as much as 5x a given market in different phases 
as you get the product right. So the MVP should be targeted at a very small market. And the ego of the entrepreneur often gets in the way because they say, my product or service is great for everybody. And so you have to have the discipline to trim down your market to, to be more successful. You have to have a product road roadmap that expands the product functionality and target markets or creates a portfolio of market strategy. And we're going to hit on that in a minute. Ultimately, if you want to raise capital and if you're going to scale at 50%, you need to raise capital 95 or 99% of the time. There may be a, a few exceptions out there. You know, if you have 95% gross margins that you can throttle the business and, and still grow it at 50%. But it's very rare. You're going to have to attract capital and you're going to have to attract a quality team to be able to handle the scaling. So you, you need to plan on bringing in investors. The reflex that says my product and services for everyone is deadly for startups and no one's going to believe it anyway. And, and you know, because venture capitalists have been burned by this problem so many times. So here is how you do a market entry strategy. And, and this has been a partial replay of workshop number four on defining a market entry strategy. For access to the full session and the other 12 sessions, please call or sign up at entrepreneurshipu.com using the links shown above. These sessions happen every first Wednesday of the month and will be available until August 2024 filling out the 12 sessions and they are designed to team for teams to sync your language and strategy and design of a business that is scalable most businesses are not scalable and the purpose of this workshop series is to lay out a roadmap and to make everyone on the team aware of what's necessary to make and build a company as you go that is scalable. This is Bob Norton signing off, and may all your business ventures be successful. That's it for the lecture portion. We're 50 minutes in. I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, airtight management, this is the diagram of the six major systems that make up the whole framework of airtight management. It's, it's completely unique, supported by 500 training videos, and it's the world's most comprehensive leadership operating system or growth operating system, if you prefer, for small companies in the, in the million to 30 million dollar area to cut eight to 10 years potentially off the learning curve of a company that's ready to scale. We generally only work with companies that already have a million dollars in sales and a product market fit. And we come in and over a year, we'll implement all these systems, train the management team in, uh, in best practices and, and help them get to a 50% growth rate. And recently we introduced our platinum program, which guarantees to add $10 million to a company's valuation uh, as well as, depending on the circumstances, you have to qualify, obviously, but get them to 50 to 100% growth in their second year after we've installed all the systems and they're, they're cranking with all those things happening. So that's it today. I'm going to hang around and, and take questions for anyone. Here is the schedule. If you haven't seen it, you can take a screenshot of that, throw it in your calendar. Uh, you know, Outlook, you can say the first Wednesday of every month. And uh, we'll be doing these through August of next year. Uh, this is number four. And all of these will go into our learning management system so that uh, if, if you have access to that, you can have access you know, for, for years and, and uh, teach your team all this stuff. I'll send this out with the slides for, for people that want it too. This is a pocket guide to those three market sizes and, and defining them a little bit.